scriptures, and if you have a Bible, if you would kindly open it to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to work from there forward through this book. It's in the New Testament, partway through the New Testament, the back section of your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I also want to uh, just follow up with uh, the announcement about our family meeting this evening. Uh, whether you participate on Zoom or come here in person for that, uh, part of our meeting time tonight is uh, we want to hear from one another about uh, how your care groups are going. And uh, we've, we've heard from some of our care group leaders. Uh, many of you have been invited to care groups. If you're a part of this church family, all of you should have received an invitation. Uh, if you're not a part of a care group, uh, please contact the church office so that we can have someone invite you to their group. But the last three Sundays, we've not met in person, but we've been meeting in 24 different care groups around our community. And some of those care groups have been meeting in person, in people's backyards. Some have been meeting over Zoom. Uh, some have been meeting around a table for lunch or for breakfast, so there's lots of uh, creative ways they're getting together. Uh, Janelle and I are part of a care group, and uh, I just wanted to mention this this morning as a word of praise. Uh, it's really good for us to be here together with our large group today, but uh, Janelle and I have some folks in our care group that uh, for almost two years have not been a part of being able to come and worship with us. And that's Barb and Lee Eimers. And they've been watching services online faithfully over those years since we've been putting, posting the services online. But for them to be with a group of like six or eight other people watching the service together and then talking about it has been an amazing blessing and encouragement. So I know for some of us, a care group is a step down maybe in worship together. But for them, and Melissa Friesen is with us, and she watches from Togo and is a part of that process with us. She loves it also. And for her and for the Imers, it's a step up to be in care groups. So we want to talk about that tonight, how that's going. And then we also want to, to continue a discussion and have a discussion together just about some of the events that are going on in our world and our response to that. And last month we talked to quite a bit in our uh, family meeting about just what it means to uh, respond to one another who, who are responding very differently to a virus. And now people are responding very differently to the death of George Floyd and now to all the other things that are happening in our country that just... It's unusual times. And if we ever really needed to be together to have a talk about stuff that's going on in our culture, it's tonight. But we also recognize that some are not able to be here together. And we recognize tonight we're not going to be able to provide child care. So we want you to participate with Zoom. And we hope that that works well. And you can uh, put your comments uh, in through Zoom. And we can uh, represent them as we meet here together. But please come back together or please get in on the Zoom call tonight so that we can have a good family talk about some of those things. All right, does that make sense? So this morning, we get to participate in a few moments with the Lord's table, the communion service, as it's sometimes called, right? And uh, you're going to receive those elements here in just a few moments, but before we do... I just want to talk a little bit about what that communion service and what the communion table is about. And I'll start with this. Uh, for the first time in a long time, over the last two weeks, uh, I've been hearing more about monuments than I think I've done my whole life put together. And uh, just about a week ago or so, I believe the monument of Christopher Columbus in the city of Columbus, Ohio, was, was taken down, and uh, I think it's being put in a museum eventually. But uh, we've been hearing about monuments, and monuments are erected, and they stand 
in place to remind us about something from the past. And uh, whether it's good or bad from the past, it's part of history from the past. And uh, in, a, in a sense, today, when we participate in the Lord's Supper together, and we take the bread together, and we drink the cup together, it's also memorializing an event that happened in the past. And what's really special is when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, He instituted it with like the most basic things. We don't need a copper statue or, or any great monument. It's the simplest bread and the simplest drink that Jesus says, do this in remembrance of what I've done. And people all over the world have access to the monument, in a sense, of the Lord's table or the Lord's supper. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we just want to start there and we're going to then skip back to uh, chapter 10 in a moment. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Starting in verse 4, I'm reading from the NIV translation. It says this, I always thank God for you because of His grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in Him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writing here to the church in Corinth, these believers, giving them this hope, this promise. And then he says in verse 9, God who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. And a word I just want to look at this morning is in this uh, verse translated fellowship in verse 9. God has called you into Fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. And that word fellowship is a word that uh, is a very special word. Uh, it's koinonia in the Greek. And the, the, the breadth of its meaning and the depth of its meaning is just so rich. But here is the first place in 1 Corinthians where fellowship is mentioned. It says, God has called you into fellowship with His Son. So I know we have lots of children in here this morning. We're glad you're here. Families, we're glad you're here. Uh, I remember uh, my Awana Club days, and I remember a certain event, and I don't know if they still do it because it's slightly dangerous, but the three-legged race. Who's familiar with the three-legged race? All right, a few of you, right? And it's you and your partner, and the middle leg, the leg between you gets, gets strapped together, with some very dangerous rope that if you fall different directions, the bone, bones and the joints uh, become separated at times. But what's the, what's the idea of this race? Is there's two people who are in step, who are coordinating step by step to move forward, and they're doing it together. And in some way, that's a very simple illustration of kind of what it means to have fellowship with Jesus to be in step with Him, or some of the other words that are, that are associated with this koinonia or fellowship, to have partnership, right? Someone doing a three-legged race with somebody else, they're partners. They're having a partnership in this, a participation, a sharing. Certainly they're sharing in their movement as they're going forward. A community, an intimacy, or even our word communion moving together in fellowship. So flip to the right just a few pages to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want us to look starting at verse 14. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 14. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry, I speak to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. 
is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ and is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ because there is one loaf we who are many are one body for we all partake of the one loaf and in verse 16 our word fellowship or koinonia shows up twice in verse 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a koinonia, a fellowship, a participation, a communion, some of your translations might say, a sharing in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread we break a koinonia, a fellowship, a communion, a participation, a sharing in the body of Christ? This is not the communion passage that's coming in chapter 11 that we typically think of. But here in chapter 10, Paul is linking very specifically to the communion passage. And he says that when we come together to drink of the cup together and eat of the bread together, there's a special, significant fellowship that we declare when we do that with Jesus. So here's another way to maybe think about this. Uh, it's not in our culture. We can have anybody over and grab a meal, grab a bite to eat, go out to a restaurant, whether they're a friend or an acquaintance. But uh, in some places in the Eastern culture, to have a meal with someone, to prepare a meal and invite them to a special meal, is of special significance. It's identifying with that person. It's agreeing with that person. It's having this, this koinonia, this fellowship, this sharing, this participation, this intimacy that's at a deeper level than we would just go out to grab a cup of coffee or something to eat. It's meaningful. And in fact, uh, it shows up in the Gospels when at times the Pharisees criticized what Christ was choosing to do when He was eating with sinners. And Zacchaeus, remember He went to Zacchaeus' house and Zacchaeus came to put his faith in Jesus on that day. But those standing outside, the Pharisees were judging Christ and saying, how could He go to that house and have fellowship or union with Zacchaeus, this known sinner. Right? So it means something. So if you go over to chapter 11 now, and verse 23, chapter 11 and verse 23, Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We often stop there in our reading of the text, and we'll reread this again when we celebrate communion together. But in verse 27, there's some, some further words of caution or warning here. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. What does it mean to participate in an unworthy manner. Well, a part of that, a significant part of that is what does it mean to have fellowship with Jesus? What does it mean when He prepares a table, a meal for us, and we come in and we eat with Him? What is that saying to other people who see us eating with Jesus? It's saying to them that we're in a three-legged race with Jesus. It's saying to them that our lives 
our choices, our priorities, our behaviors, our attitudes are consistent with Jesus, fellowship, participation, intimacy, all of those words, unity, communion with Jesus, that's what we're saying in that moment when we're coming into Jesus' house to eat His supper. That we have fellowship with Him. That's what that's about. And so, to eat unworthily is to come today to this moment and to participate in Jesus' meal while our hearts are far from Him. And while our desires are far from pleasing Him. And we're stone cold toward Jesus every other time, but because everyone else here, it seems like, is going to participate in communion, we should too because maybe that'll do something in my my standing before God, at least I did this little act for whatever purpose it was, and Jesus would say, you're doing that unworthily. You're not in step with me in your life, so communion doesn't mean anything. So don't participate. And then he goes on here, and he says this, verse 28, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. What's this judgment? For those who are God's children, As Darcy testified today, she's made a decision to follow Jesus and baptism was her obedient response to that decision that she's made. For all of God's children, those who've believed in Jesus, they're part of His family, this judgment is a corrective judgment, a corrective discipline. It's it's, please get back on track. It's done lovingly. It's why a parent disciplines a child. To, to conform their will to the will of the parent. And Jesus does it the same way. If you're, going to, if you're going to say you have fellowship with me, then you need to act that way and behave that way. So in the center of your bulletins, perhaps you uh, have those and something maybe to write with, but there's just a really short outline and let's just, if you would with me, take a moment maybe just to fill in this outline. The Lord's Supper. It's a sacred and holy memorial service that reminds us of what Jesus has done in the past. Number one there, are you worthy to participate in the Lord's Supper? Are you worthy? I just want to pause here and say that not only does Jesus invite us to His table, but ultimately it's only through Jesus that we come to the table. It's an interesting thing. None of us apart from Jesus are worthy. Right? None of us apart from Him are worthy. But, point number two there, is your life in fellowship Is your life in union? Is your life in community? Communion. Is your life consistent in participating with Jesus? Sharing with Jesus? Are you? Is the the response of your heart in in union and step with Jesus in the three-legged race with Jesus? Are you in fellowship with Jesus? That's the idea there. And then number three, we're to examine ourselves. Examine yourself to avoid God's judgment and discipline. Examine yourself. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to one final passage, that's near the very, very end of the New Testament. In 1 John, 
1 John chapter 1. The very end of the New Testament, just about before Revelation, before Jude, first, second, third John, the first book of John. In verse 5, I just want to begin reading 1 John 1 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Verse 6 If we claim to have fellowship, there's our word. If we claim to have fellowship, if we claim to have communion and sharing and participation, a oneness and intimacy with Jesus, if we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. What's being described here? A person who's unworthy. Right? They're not living in agreement with what they say they are. They're not living in fellowship. They're unworthy. Verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as He, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Verse 8, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And I love this promise to all of us this morning. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His Word has no place in our lives. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ. The righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. I invite uh, those of you that are going to play here quietly uh, up to the stage. and I just want to give us a few moments for you to ask the Holy Spirit to examine your heart and how are you doing in your three-legged race with Jesus today? And what part of obedience to Jesus are you struggling with? And claim these promises in 1 John. If we confess, He cleanses. His atoning sacrifice has made a way. Because before we participate in the Lord's Supper, we want to make sure that we're doing it in a worthy manner. So let's just take a couple of moments and pray quietly where you are.